Hey, I'm Shovel, and in this video, I've got my SN95 lifted way up in the air so we can talk about why these cars usually handle poorly when people lower them and how to avoid that problem. I did make a video kind of sort of like this about six months ago, but I didn't really bring it in for a landing the way I wanted to, and so I'm remaking it, hopefully a bit tighter, to get you the information you need to make the best choices you can on this. Now, we're gonna be talking about some stuff underneath the car, so I'm gonna go ahead and lower you down a little bit first, and then we'll talk about it down here. To start us off on the right foot, let's go ahead and get real elementary with this uh, foam block right here. We learn real early in childhood when something's tall, it's unstable, and when it's low, it's stable. So it would stand to reason that the lower you make your car, the more stable your car becomes. And that would make sense if your car was a solid foam block with no suspension at all. But cars have suspension, and that's why all this stuff suddenly begins to matter. Additionally, we have a little bit of vocabulary we need to talk about. First one is real easy, I'm sure you understand it, and that's the center of mass. Since this is a solid foam block, the center of mass, that means the area in it where all of the different material this is made out of is equally kind of distributed around that point. Since this is a solid foam block, we can pretty well ascertain that the center of mass is right in the geometric center of this block. That's easy. Cars are not solid blocks of foam. They have a bunch of different heavy parts distributed around them. They have empty parts distributed around them. And so you have to actually figure out where the center of mass is on the car. There is a way to actually calculate the center of mass on a car. You have to put the wheels on four scales and then start tilting the car and measure how much weight transfer occurs at each degree that you tilt the car. And then you can pretty easily work out where the center of mass is on the car. But we don't really have to do that because we're not really trying to get super precise here. We're talking about principles in this particular conversation. So the center of mass on a car like this is typically going to be right around where the gear shift knob is. That just happens to be where it is. The center of mass in two dimensions, meaning just like talking about the front suspension, is typically going to be where the pony is. And I'm sorry if you don't see that. The importance of the center of mass on a car is that when the car is trying to change speed or direction, the center of mass is the geometric point that's actually doing the pushing. So for example, if this was our car and it was really tall and it was going down the road and then it started trying to turn, the center of mass being right here in the middle of it has all this leverage to push the car over or to make it lean, so to speak. As opposed to if you had this car low and it was still driving along, going around a corner, now your center of mass is way down here, so it can't knock it over. The center of mass doesn't have any leverage. There's very little weight transfer taking place because there isn't a very long lever between where the contact patch on the ground is and where the center of mass is located. Which means in general for a solid object, the lower the center of mass is to the ground, the less the car is going to transfer weight to the outside wheels and the less it's going to be likely to roll over. I think that's pretty easy to understand. Now we're going to talk about the kind of weird one. That's the instant center. And I'm going to point at stuff using this masonry bit because it's red and it shows up on camera. So when you go around a corner, you turn the steering wheel. The steering wheel turns your tires. I think you understand that pretty well. And that means that whenever there is a force acting on the car to make the car change direction, i.e. the ground's ability to impart force on the car, that force is imparted on the bottom contact patch of the tire because where else would it do it, right? What that means is that the bottom of the tire has to resolve those forces through the suspension and somehow get that force into the body to make the body start changing direction. But because you have a flexible suspension member here, you've got a pivot point there, you've got a pivot point at the ball joint, and you also have a strut that changes length as the suspension cycles, that means that there's only one point in space somewhere out here that the distance from the bottom of the tire's contact patch to the kind of chassis of the vehicle doesn't change length. That means you have a fixed point somewhere out here that all of these forces kind of resolve in. And so even though the tire is actually pushing on the ball joint and then that's actually pushing on the control arm and that's actually pushing on this pivot point, some of that force also gets pushed up into the strut or pulls on the strut potentially. And that means that there's an imaginary point somewhere out here that doesn't change length. And when your suspension is at stock height, when you haven't lifted or lowered your SN95, that imaginary point in space is actually right around the lower ball joint of the opposite side tire. So whenever you're going around a corner, this tire here is pushing on or pulling on the lower ball joint over here. And of course, this tire over here is pushing on or pulling on the lower ball joint way over here. If you lower your car by two inches, that takes this lower control arm and it moves it kind of up at this angle. And that makes it so your instant center, instead of being like right around at the ball joint of the opposite side, it puts it like way down here, somewhere in the far off corner, below the ground in the middle of nowhere. That itself doesn't actually change a whole lot. That's not the part that's important here. What's important is that you figure out your roll center based around where those two lines intersect between the bottom of the tire's contact patch and the instant center. So for example, when the bottom of your tire's contact patch has a line that goes up here to the lower ball joint on this side, and this tire has its contact patch and you draw a line from there, to the ball joint here, 
you end up with a spot somewhere right around you here, and that's where the roll center is for the car at its stock height. Let's go ahead and put something right where that roll center is. So let's talk about what the roll center even is to begin with. Uh, when you're going around a corner, assuming that all your tires remain stuck to the ground, the body of the car is still going to lean a little bit, and it's allowed to lean by the compliance of the suspension itself. The springs are able to change length, because that's kind of the whole deal with springs. The other different parts of the suspension are not allowed to change length, but they are allowed to change their orientation relative to each other. That's what the pivot points are, like your ball joints and your bushings and stuff like that. They don't have a singular point on them that they all just come together at physically. There's not like a single ball joint somewhere floating in space, but there is an imaginary ball joint floating in space that all those different forces are allowed to kind of rotate around, and that is your roll center. That, in the case of an SN95, relative to the body is right around here when your suspension has its stock ride height. When you haven't adjusted the static ride height of the car, it's stock. Relative to the body of the car, it's right around here. If the car was down on the ground, this would be about four inches above the ground. It's about four inches above the ground on a stock, static ride height, hasn't been altered SN95 or New Edge Mustang, which means there's about an 18 inch lever between the roll center and the center of mass. I don't think I need to explain how levers work to you, but just kind of so that we can illustrate it a little bit. If you have a short-ish lever, right, you've got a lever of whatever length here, it's got a pivot point at some particular point along it, and you impart a force on it, you push that force, and it's able to put a certain amount of work into that pivot point, even if it's trying to resist that push or that rotation. If you lower the pivot point, you have a longer lever, which means that the same force up here now is able to move that a lot more easily. And that means that the longer the lever is between your roll center and your center of mass, the more the body is able to lean, assuming the same spring stiffness and all else is equal. That's fine until you start lowering one of these cars because when you lower an SN95 or New Edge Mustang or anything else that uses the same type of suspension geometry using lowering springs or coilovers that don't actually change the pivot points of the rest of the suspension, you lower the roll center by about two and a half times the amount that you lower the car. So for example, if you lower this car by two inches, you lower the roll center by five inches. Relative to the body, that means that you lower the roll center by about three inches. So the roll center is about three inches farther away from the center of mass, which means that you have about a three inch longer lever. That's about 20% more, which means that if your lowering springs have the same spring rate as your stock springs, when you lower the car by about two inches, you're gonna have about 20% more body roll. Most lowering springs try to address this by just simply being 20% stiffer, but that's not really a solution. When you make your suspension stiffer, it narrows that kind of margin that you have between being in control and out of control. That itself isn't like a one-to-one -one relationship, but it is a fairly universal relationship. The more stiffly sprung a car is, the more easily it's upset by disturbances, the more easily it becomes kind of sketchy when you're driving it at the limits. So it's not really desirable from a performance perspective to have too stiff of springs. And additionally, it rides like a pogo stick and that just kind of sucks. And that's just one of the reasons why lowering one of these cars using springs or coilovers actually makes them handle worse. That's not an opinion, that's, that's the math. It makes them worse. There is a way to bypass this entire problem, which I'll tell you about in a moment, but first we're gonna talk about how the roll center moves when you lower one of these cars too, because that's also important. Let's go ahead and put this back up at the stock height. Because the roll center is kind of in a virtual location, it's not like a fixed pin that's like bolted through the car that the car rotates around. The roll center moves around relative to the car as the car suspension cycles and moves. That's kind of why it moves when you lower the car, but it also moves when your car starts leaning because you have sort of a lift on one side and a lower on the other side or vice versa. And so the roll center actually moves around as your car begins to lean. And that has some pretty serious consequences with regards to traction. The roll center's name is roll, right? That's a circular sounding word. And that's because the center of mass actually wants to kind of orbit that. So if you imagine that we're taking a left-hand turn, the body of the car wants to lean in that direction, the roll center is going to move when the car starts leaning. If the car is at stock ride height or has stock suspension geometry and you start turning towards the left, the body of the car starts leaning towards the right, the roll center actually moves a little bit over towards the left. What happens there is since the center of mass wants to orbit around this, it's going to move at about a 90 degree angle relative to this. It's gonna go like that away. It's trying to go at this kind of like 90 degree orbit around the roll center. And what that means is as the car begins to lean, it's going to start taking some of the lateral friction from this tire here and convert that into downward force on that outer tire out there. 
So the net total amount of force being pushed on the outer tires here is going to be the lateral traction from this tire here, plus the weight of the car, plus any weight transfer that gets moved over to that outer wheel. The net result is that that wheel is going to get an increase in traction at it because it has more downforce on it without raising the overall actual mass of the car. What's crucial about this is that that's a downward trajectory. This vector here is down that way because the roll center moved over here. When you lower one of these cars, that gets all cattywumpus. If you lower one of these cars, remember we take this roll center and we drop it down, but it also goes over here, way over here. Now the roll center is way over there because we lowered the car by two inches. It's over there, and remember, we've got this orbital that goes this direction now. It's no longer pushing down on that wheel. So we start taking this left-hand turn, the body of the car starts leaning, the roll center goes way over there, and now the center of mass has a vector in that direction because remember, it's trying to go at a 90 degree angle to where the roll center is. It's no longer pushing down on the outer tire. It's not taking the weight transfer from this wheel and adding it over there. It's taking the weight transfer from this wheel and sending it up there. That's making the car more likely to actually roll all the way over because it's taking weight off the inside wheel and not necessarily adding it to the outside wheel. It's adding it to that away. So some of your forward momentum as you go around the corner is getting converted into lift at the front of the car. Not what you want. So hopefully I've made it clear that if you lower one of these cars using just lowering springs or coilovers, it doesn't do you any favors. It makes the car actually handle worse. It kind of sucks, honestly. There's a couple different ways you can address this if you want to lower one of these cars. I think the most obvious one is just to lower it the way that you were going to lower it anyways, and then, crucially, be honest with yourself and others about the fact that it handles worse. That's not my opinion. For the reasons we just went over, it is worse if you lower one of these using just springs or coilovers, but if you're honest with yourself about it, you're like, you know what, I just like the way that it looks. I'm not driving at 10 tenths. I'm not leaving car shows all sideways. I'm not actually racing. I don't have to tell people that it's faster. I just have to tell people, hey, look at how it looks. And I think that's completely valid. If you're making it as an art project, you want it to look a certain way and you're willing to put up with the compromises, rock on, no problem. Second way that you can address it is if you're only gonna lower it about an inch or so, probably the most cost-effective way to address it correctly with geometry is to get lower control arms that have tall ball joints. BMR, for example, makes lower control arms that are tubular, they're lighter, less unsprung weight, and they have ball joints that are taller, and that corrects about an inch of lowering. The way those work is that the ball joint itself is located at the end of the control arm, just like the stock ones are, but the stud that sticks out the top of the ball joint is about an inch longer. And that means the pivot point itself and the angle of the control arm stays about an inch below where the spindle is. And that means that you get about an inch of drop out of that automatically and you don't lose any of your geometry. The only downside to that really is that you lose an inch of up travel on your strut, just like you would with lowering springs or with a coilover, which means that if you are driving at 10 tenths and then you hit a disturbance in the road, you're gonna transition from suspended to bump stop and possibly lose control of the car. That extra inch of buffer would be nice to have. But if you're not actually racing and you just want to lower the car like at an inch or so just for cosmetic reasons and you don't want to give up any of your handling, tall ball joints are a great way to go about that. I would totally recommend that, especially for like a medium budget. The next step up from that, if you want to lower it a whole two inches with really no compromises and probably better handling, is spindles. Spindles are the outermost part of the suspension that the wheel bolts onto and the brake bolts onto. So you've got this spindle, that's what moves up and down with the suspension as the tire rolls over bumps and stuff like that. And it's got a stub axle on it that the tire itself bolts to and lowering spindles just move that axle up relative to the spindle. So with the axle about two inches higher up on the spindle, that means that the body and the suspension and a whole assembly of your car moves down two inches relative to the tire. And of course the tire rolls on the road which means that your whole car, well, the whole front of your car gets lowered by two inches without changing anything about the suspension geometry. And because the contact patch at the bottom of your tire is closer to your lower ball joint, you actually end up putting your roll center closer to your center of mass. So you end up kind of with that kind of benefit, which means that you get less body roll naturally. You have no suspension compromises. You get the full travel of your strut. Really, it's the only way to go if you really wanna do a great job of lowering one of these cars. Now you still give up ground clearance, that's kind of the whole deal with lowering, but you don't give up anything when it comes to handling, and arguably you might get slightly better handling that way. So hopefully I've done a better job this video than I did last video of explaining this. There's also quite a lot of interaction between the back of the car and the front of the car since this is a three-dimensional object, and when you go around corners there's weight transfer in all the different directions, and when you lower it using spindles, you don't introduce any new problems in that too. 
The relationship between the back of the car's roll center and the front of the car's roll center is a whole other video. I don't have time to do that today, but let me know in the comments down below if you want me to expand on that and talk about the three-dimensional aspects of this, because today we've only been talking about the front. Anyway, thanks for watching.